Welcome. My name is Dr. Barbara Yon, and I'm Professor of Family and Community Health at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, Minnesota, USA. And I am joined in this session by Professor Iona Agache, who is Professor of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Transylvania University in Brasov, Romania, and by Ms. Jojo O'Neill, a patient and advocate for others with asthma from Deland, Florida. Welcome. In this section, we'll be considering the question, severe asthma, what are the daily challenges for patients and their families? And let's begin by first defining what severe asthma is. Professor Agachi, from a clinical standpoint, can you talk about what severe asthma is and how it's different than difficult to treat asthma, please? Well, thank you very much for this question. So uh, we usually look at the GINA definition, GINA meaning Global Initiative for Asthma, which is the major guideline dealing with asthma. Uh, we have two categories, as you mentioned, difficult to treat asthma and severe asthma. Uh, difficult to treat asthma is in, uh, in a nutshell, asthma that is uncontrolled despite high level treatment. It is often difficult to treat because there are some several modifiable factors like the patient adherence to treatment or exposure to triggers and it, or comorbidities. Severe asthma in opposition is again asthma that is uncontrolled despite high level treatment or when you try to, or asthma that worsens when you try to taper down the high dose treatment. And it affects four to 10% of patients with asthma. The difference here, the major difference is the modifiable factors that could be addressed in one way or not addressed in the other way, but in the real life, this is not always feasible. Ms. O'Neill, tell us what severe asthma is from a patient perspective, please. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate um, and for hearing the voice of an asthma patient, a former asthma sufferer, uh, as now I have the symptoms under control. But for me, severe asthma was every one to two months having an increase of inflammation in my lungs, um, having the cough, that rattle cough, um, not being able to breathe, uh, wheezing. And these exasperations would come about even after taking daily maintenance meds. Uh, and so that, that was a real struggle for me um, not knowing how long was I able to go between exacerbations. And so that's when um, my doctor basically diagnosed it as severe initially. So for you, it was the exacerbations that were the major problem for the severe asthma. Absolutely. My breathing was compromised and the wheezing and the coughing and the rattle. Um, I would get the looks from people around me when I'd cough because they would kind of move away naturally. So because they're thinking she either has a cold or the flu or whatever, and um, they had no idea that these are asthma symptoms. And so I, I, I try to educate people on, on uh, some of the things that we experience as asthma patients. Well, and I think that brings up a, a really great perspective of it's not just you that's affected. It's also you, your family, your social interactions. So, uh, Professor Gachi, when you have uh, someone coming into the office for an evaluation, what kind of things do you think about as their daily challenges, as well as your daily challenges in practice? But first of all, I would like to understand the patient journey because I think that this is important and this is something that is really peculiar to every patient that you see in the clinic. I think that we should start by that. So I start by understanding, first of all, uh, his necessity, his needs to control the disease. What is most important for the patient? Because for one patient, just having, let's say, one to exacerbations per year is enough for the others. Having the perfect fit to go, you know, go on the mountains or something like that is uh, their aim. So you have to first understand this, and then we have to understand 
the background of how they are going to be able to control the disease because they might not have access to proper care, they might not have the resources there, uh, or even to, to avoid the triggers, for example, they need to continue their professional exposure if they, they are not, uh, uh, in order not to lose their income. Ms. O'Neill, you talked about the impact. What is some of the other things you'd like people to hear about severe asthma? Just to understand that when your breathing is compromised, it affects you in a lot of different ways. Even psychologically, it's very scary. Um, it can cause anxiety and panic attacks. And um, I just really like to educate, in addition to educating asthma patients, the people around us um, to, to help us stay calm if you see us uh, struggling to breathe, to, to sit us upright instead of laying us back because that helps us to breathe, to, to know that, you know, help us to look for our inhaler um, so that we can uh, get the, the treatment that we need. Um, it's just, it's, it's interesting that um, asthma sometimes seems to get overlooked by the general public and somewhat taken for granted. Uh, and they go, oh, it's just asthma. Well, that means that we're not breathing well. And you know what happens when we don't breathe. <laughs> so that's, that's my whole uh, issue is to just make uh, people more aware of just how dangerous asthma is. And of course, we're here talking about severe asthma, which brings on um, uh, lots of other issues as well. Well, and some people with severe asthma, in addition to exacerbations every month or so, are having symptoms every day or every night. They wake up at night, multiple nights a week and talk about not being able to sleep and then you can't breathe either. I yeah. think that people do need to understand with severe asthma, it affects every aspect of your life day and night. You are so absolutely right. Um, and what I had to realize that what I was doing to my family and loved ones, people who were around me, really was kind of unfair because they had to watch me struggle to breathe and listen to me wheeze and cough. And there was nothing that they could do about it. They felt helpless. And so I had to, it was a selfish move in a, in a, in a way. I had to realize that, you know what, I, I need to just go ahead and get the treatment I need so that I'm not causing any issues with my family members because they are very fearful and watching me have to go through this. Professor Agache, what kind of things do you see with the patients for the social and economic burden associated with severe asthma? Well, I would say that they are severely incapacitated by this disease before it gets controlled. It is very dramatic to see the impact on their lives and on their careers and uh, on their families. Uh, they, are, they do have lower employment rates, they do need frequent job changes, and I was mentioning this is sometimes not possible, so they endure their symptoms in order to, to keep to the, uh, to the revenue. They do report decreased productivity at work, and uh, of course, as we have heard, they have significant social restrictions if they want to avoid the triggers of their severe asthma. What is even more important is that, uh, for example, they um, overuse some of their medication in order to control symptoms and not to, uh, let's say, uh, lose the risk factors that they are exposed to. So they prefer to keep the cat or go to some professional, professional exposure instead of stepping out and then overuse their rescue medication or even worse, their oral corticosteroids in order to control the symptoms. And sometimes they do not report this to you as their clinician. And this is very important that you are aware of this, let's say a rescue thing was done by the patient himself and try to educate him not to do this anymore because this is very dangerous in the long term. Ms. O'Neill, were you ever on oral steroids? And Talk a little bit about what it was like on oral steroids and the burden of your treatment. It was really tough. Um, of course, I, I liked the way it made me feel. It certainly helped my breathing. But on the flip side of that, there were many side effects on uh, oral steroid medications, um, starting with increased appetite, weight gain, uh, cushing of the skin, facial distortion. There were people who'd known me for years 
and would see me and not recognize me until I began to speak. They recognize my voice and they go, Jojo, is that you? You know, many changes uh, because of, of those medications. Um, yeah, I was breathing great, but it really just did a number on my body in high doses. Yes. And how about your experience with treatment with complexity? Did you have trouble with multiple inhalers and things like that? My personal experience, uh, I was only on one inhaler, um, but uh, I was overusing it at times, trying to compensate for um, my, my breathing, uh, decline in my breathing. So yeah, it, it's, it's so true. Everything she said is so true. We do have a tendency to, to overuse those inhalers and medications and, and trying to keep going and, and compensating for, for um, the issues that we're dealing with, the coughs and the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the compromised breathing and the inflammation. I had a, a lot of issues with uh, severe inflammation uh, in my lungs and wheezing. And so it really uh, was a very difficult time yeah, dealing with uh, severe asthma symptoms. May I bring something more if I, if I can? Certainly, please. Uh, thinking about the overuse of medication, we need to think also that the severe asthma is frequently associated with comorbidities, like for example, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps or uh, atopic dermatitis or uh, chronic urticaria a little bit less. But uh, for example, uh, even if you do not need the corticosteroids for your severe asthma, you might need to control your upper airways, for example, your nasal polyposis. So this adds to the burden that you have for severe asthma. And when you uh, put in the long run, the, the, the load of oral steroids, this is going to be extremely high. And I think you're so right, is that oral corticosteroids are the very last Thing we should think about. Yes, we use them short term occasionally for exacerbations, but even using them two or three times a year for an exacerbation over the next 10, 12, 20, 30 years even, that is a lot of exposure. And so we need to think about what can we do to prevent the use of oral corticosteroids daily, but also for frequent exacerbations. Hello, I'm Ioana Gaccia, I'm Professor of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at Transylvania University in Brasov, Romania. And I'm very happy to be here today with Professor Barbara Ion, which is a Professor of Family and Community Health at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, US. And uh, we are also by Professor Alberto Papi, Professor of Respiratory Medicine at the University of Ferrara in Italy. We will focus on, uh, on this um, discussion on the role of biologicals in severe type 2 asthma. How do patients benefit? We know very well that uh, <clears throat> uh, according to the recently published Lancet Commission, we entered a third era in the asthma management that considers the heterogeneity of asthma and delivers precision medicine, uh, precision disease management based on disease characteristics. And we are moving from the one size fits all approach for asthma because of the increased knowledge of the underlying mechanisms of asthma, because we have easily measurable biomarkers of T2 uh, uh, inflammation, and because we have uh, uh, available several biologicals that target specific inflammatory pathways. So I would like to start uh, today by uh, addressing the uh, asking Professor Alberto Papi to provide us an overview of the approved biologicals for second life treatment in severe asthma. Thank you, Anna. It's a, it's a very important question because now in severe asthma, we can uh, personalize treatment uh, um, having uh, different biologics that target specific pathways. Well, the, the, the first uh, biologic that has become available, it's... Uh, Omalizumab, so it's uh, a biologic for severe uh, allergic asthma because it targets uh, uh, IgE. 
and so it targets that that uh, uh, severe asthma with uh, ATOP as uh, the main clinical expression. Then we have a group of monoclonal antibodies targeting uh, interleukin-5 or interleukin-5 receptors. So the word of uh, eosinophils, and it is uh, uh, severe eosinophilic asthma, mainly exacerbations and what is related to exacerbations. <clears throat> and we have uh, uh, currently available um, dupilumab, which, which is uh, uh, mm, more upstream. It's not on the effectors like eosinophils or IgE, but it is on uh, a receptor of interleukin-4 alpha, which is shared by interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. So it covers more than one single pathways. And this is, it covers, I would say, the T2 <clears throat> underlying mechanisms. Um, again, eosinophils, but not only. We have with this, with this uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, um, uh, pheno, uh, nitric oxide, uh, that is a marker for uh, eligibility when it is increased. Interestingly, uh, there are uh, clinical markers that are often associated with the clinical presentation of this disease. Uh, I'm referring to comorbidities, and indeed some of these Biologics have specific indication for comorbidities. So it's, it's a, a wide field uh, that is gonna uh, be even better defined in the, in the future with the new monoclonal antibodies that are currently in development. Thank you very much, Alberto. Professor Leon, do you have any um, experience with this monoclonals uh, used in your clinic in the primary care field or do you see patients which have received this um, monoclonals? The point that I'm trying to make here is that sometimes between randomized control trials and what we have as a result from there, what is happening in real life in terms of effectiveness is a little bit different. So do you have any insights from the, the, the clinical field how these are working? Well, helping to decide which patients need which of the different biologics has been very, very helpful with my special colleagues doing that. And then the patients coming back, I have been quite impressed uh, that they have noticed a significant difference uh, and having them not stop their other medications uh, because they've started a biologic is always one of the things that we see, but have been very pleased overall uh, with the response to the biologics. I think that this is a very interesting, uh, and uh, we, are, we are very happy that we were all very nervous when we made the leap from, the, from clinical trials to real life. We thought that the efficacy might be a little bit different because the population that we are seeing in real life is different from clinical trials. But it seems that it parallels very well, uh, for example, the, the, what we are seeing in, in, uh, in uh, clinical trials. What about safety signals? Do we have any safety signals with the use of these biologicals also in clinical trials in real life and also in primary care that, uh, so Alberto maybe- Yeah, can... yeah, very good question. But the safety, the safety um, issue comes out with uh, um, the clinical practice. And I would value um, on this topic, <clears throat> The long-term studies, uh, uh, open label that has been quite often done after each of the randomized control trial. I'm thinking, for example, of the Traverse uh, um, that has been just published uh, uh, with a, a treatment that lasts for almost three years. So uh, not only it says that the the efficacy is maintained over three years. If anything, it's even improved while patients are over three years on the same uh, biologics. But there is no main uh, issue of uh, uh, related to safety. Actually, those signal that sometimes has appeared in the, in the main study, uh, in the long run, they disappear 
I mean, they are transient and with the use of the biologics, they are uh, solved uh, without any specific intervention. So the overall safety is, is, is very, uh, very nice and um, very reassuring. Well, and I think that that was something that primary care physicians really needed to watch for a little while, because I think many of us were concerned, is there going to be a problem with anaphylaxis immediately, for example? But then when you really decrease someone's eosinophils to close to zero in some of them, is that going to be a problem? Uh, and I think that these long-term studies looking over two and three, and hopefully soon five or 10 years even, will be very reassuring to primary care uh, physicians that this is a safe thing uh, for them to help support. Uh, I was mentioning that for many years, we uh, see asthma as an umbrella um, covering many phenotypes. That means many visible properties, but lastly, and also in the GINA guidelines, in the latest edition, we are talking about endotypes and mechanisms. So I would like to uh, understand from both your, uh, your uh, uh, points of view, so both from the specialized and from the primary care, what is uh, your perceived difference between phenotypes and endotypes and how you are managing this in the clinic? So Thank I you, Anna. Uh, I think I've changed my view on the, on the endotype and phenotype. Uh, um, with, I would say, with the availability of, um, of biologics, because, you know, classically endotypes are the underlying uh, mechanisms. So uh, we try to target uh, and trying to interfere with underlying pathology and mechanism. And the phenotype is the clinical expression. So we look for a biomarker related to the expression that is then related to the underlying mechanism. And I remember, and, you, and we all remember uh, these beautiful pictures uh, with the number of phenotypes, all well designed, uh, fixed airflow limitation, severe asthma, um, aspirin trigger, a number of different phenotypes, uh, which uh, were difficult then to use in clinical practice because uh, they usually overlap. Uh, uh, it's difficult to disentangle. And I think that the, the phenotype that we are using now and the phenotype that are in practice um, worth to be considered are eligibility for, different, uh, for the different uh, uh, biologics. I think that they characterize sufficiently the patient in terms to going into the mechanism that it is more likely to be effective for that patient. Well, and I think from the primary care perspective, uh, we don't spend as much time thinking about endotypes. We really probably are learning to focus on the phenotypes um, because that seems to be what helps us decide, yes, this is someone appropriate to send off for further evaluation to an allergist, for example, versus perhaps a pulmonologist, because sometimes we do make that distinction. But I think we do start thinking now about eosinophilic asthma is probably the first thing we think about. So we all agree that the eosinophilic airway inflammation is a good treatable trait and has several reliable biomarkers that we could use in the clinic and then can orient the treatment. So these are the exhaled nitric oxide and the blood eosinophil compound. May I ask you both if you have some experience with these two biomarkers that are, let's say, non-invasive and easily to orient a little bit towards a T2 phenotype? Well, I, uh, if I may start, uh... <clears throat> Eosinophils are a quite a common biomarker um, for the eligibility of almost all the biologics we have now. I think pheno is making a difference because it's specific for uh, the anti-interleukin for alpha receptor. Uh, in, uh, and, and the efficacy is even higher if we have both high eosinophils and high pheno. 
But as you pointed out earlier, Joanna, biomarker is a par part of the story. The eligibility is is the clinical presentation, is the is, uh, the trigger, is uh, the presence of comorbidities. So I value the biomarker because they are required, and particularly as I said, Fino for because it identifies a specific uh, um, um, treatment uh, possible. But yeah, it is in the context of other marker, not necessarily biologics, uh, that make the profile of the patient more eligible for one or the other. Most of us in primary care do not have pheno available. Uh, we don't do phenos in our office for a lot of reasons. Uh, but the, about the only uh, biomarker that we use regularly is the eosinophil count. What about the cutoff that we are using, Albert? What about the cutoff? Having having a <clears throat> having a continuous uh, a scale is much better because the higher, the more likely it is that you you obtain good results. Uh, uh, but we have to decide where 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 put uh, the level for yes or no, also for regulatory reasons. Uh, so um, what we are discussing now, it's 300, it's 150. Uh, and I think the more we go broader, think of the last data available, we are moving towards 150, more than 300. So um, yeah, um, I, again, uh, again, I have to stick on the data obtained from uh, uh, randomized control trial because this is what has been shown as primary outcome. So it's uh, telling us uh, for each biologics uh, the cutoff to use for uh, having a more likely uh, better and optimal effect. Okay, so I think that uh, we had a very good discussion and uh, um, I think that we um, so that we do have some uh, already at hand tools in the clinic that we can use to phenotype patients and to select those ones that are amenable to the biologicals that are uh, currently approved for severe asthma. And uh, we also have good outcomes uh, reported both in clinical trials and in real life with the use of these biologicals. So let's hope that in the future, the, the evidence coming from real life will support this further and of course, the research field will come with new biologicals that target the other pathways that are not currently covered by the current biologicals that we have. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Alberto Pape. I am professor of respiratory medicine at the University of Ferrara in Italy. And I'm pleased today to be with uh, Professor Ioana Gacci uh, from uh, Romania. She's professor of allergy and clinical immunology at the Transylvania University. And Professor Barbara Ion, uh, which uh, comes from Minneapolis. She's professor of family and community health at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> we have the pleasure to have with us also Miss O'Neill. Uh, she's a patient, a patient with uh, severe asthma and advocate for others with asthma from Leland in Florida, in Florida. Now, the topic of this session is quite challenging. Uh, optimizing long-term management of patients with severe T2 asthma, which evidence and uh, uh, clinical practice guideline should be should we deal with. We know that uh, often or usually a uh, multidisciplinary team is required uh, to manage asthma because of the different aspects related to the disease. Let's move to, to Barbara and ask how she sees the role of primary care physician in the management of patients with severe asthma and the relation with the different uh, uh, specialties. Is this an issue? Is it the coordination and the uh, organization of this type of uh, uh, 
multidisciplinary approach, something that see the primary care physician <clears throat> primarily involved? I hope so, because usually we're the ones who saw the patient first. Most patients start with their primary care site, and we're the ones that needed to recognize this looks like this is either difficult to treat or severe asthma, and I need help. So that's the first step, is recognizing that we need to go beyond what we're comfortable with, and then help facilitate the referrals to all of the other physicians. I want to hear the voice of uh, Ms. O'Neill on this topic. Has she had any experience with a, a multidisciplinary team in the management of her clinical condition? Any suggestion for everyone to follow? I think I just heard a perfect suggestion um, on that multidisciplinary approach to have uh, the doctors to communicate about the patient. It's not going to be easy for the patient to do that. Um, I, I was able to start a nonprofit organization called the Let's Kick Asthma Foundation. And uh, we are patient focused. We meet, we have support groups. We bring in healthcare professionals, doctors, respiratory therapists, uh, different uh, people to come in, experts to talk about different topics as they relate to asthma. And that's what we're trying to do. What I'm trying to do with that organization is to educate the patient so that the patient can get to a point where they are aware of the fact that maybe I need to try a multidisciplinary approach. Yeah, that's ideal. Joanna, you are very much, very much involved in, in guidelines uh, preparation. Uh, and certainly they might be a facilitator point to start with at least. But you know, there are different guidelines, not always uh, <clears throat> telling the same type of recommendation. Do you think there is something that should be done or um, for having a unique voice? Or is it the level of concordance good enough to go on with different type of uh, uh, expert telling or reading different books in terms of guidelines? Well, that's a very hard difficult issue I might say that you are raising this because the ideal situation is that we should speak the same language but you know there, there will always be peculiarities that we cannot ignore according to the specialty background that you see a little bit uh, different things and then uh, according to the location where you are and according to the resources that you have and I would say that finally the resources are dictating very much what we are doing with these guidelines because uh, they, they look very nice on paper. But when we go and try to implement them in real life, this is very, very difficult because we do not have the resources to do this. So I would say that the main key is not that we are not very well aligned between the guidelines. We are pretty much similar in the key points that we are communicating, but the implementation is extremely a disaster. Great. Uh, Barbara, uh, uh, primary care physician main uh, barriers into this uh, uh, diagnostic and treating path uh, and uh, help that can be received? Well, I think the first barrier you will always hear is time. Uh, and the resources in our office. Uh, you know, in primary care, we're expected to see a patient every seven to 10 minutes. And seven to 10 minutes is not long enough to deal with someone with a complex chronic illness. And so that's the problem. And resources, for example, we mentioned checking inhaler technique. I may not have anyone in my office who really understands all the different kinds of inhalers and is very good at that. So that's a problem. Uh, education is so critical, but that takes time. And it also takes someone who can help us with that. Uh, and then of course, we have many, many conditions we're supposed to keep up to date on the guidelines with asthma is only one of many. Uh, and so we may not be aware of the latest guidelines, um, but there are some simple inexpensive things that can help. Uh, and I'm gonna say asthma action plans are something that gets overlooked and is critical 
anybody can help write an asthma action plan. You can write it on a piece of paper. It's not expensive. And it does make a huge difference because it assures that all of us at least have one piece of paper that we all agree this is the goal and this is what we think should be done. Now, now, uh, ladies, in the, in the management of asthma, now we have these big, big opportunities, which is represented by the new, bi new biologics. Uh, I, I want again to start uh, from Mrs. O'Neill because she's been through a, a very tough story. And I want to ask what has changed um, in, in her life, I would say in general, in terms of activity relation, uh, um, possibility to, to do and not to do after she's moved into biologics? Actually, for me, um, prior to uh, being put on a biologic, I had a lot of restrictions on my life because of uh, severe asthma, the symptoms. Um, I had a lot of missed days at work. I had financial burdens because of uh, the medications and the costs and the co-pays and uh, I wasn't able to do a lot of the things that I enjoyed doing. I also enjoyed dancing and riding motorcycles and, and very physical activities that really, you know, even climbing a flight of stairs. Wow. Um, yeah, just things that, that you don't even consider until you have trouble breathing. Um, and so those were the things that I dealt with. And that was sort of my, the limitations on my lifestyle prior to uh, being placed on a biologic after uh, the biologic, my symptoms are well managed, well under control. I'm able to do uh, anything that I, I want to do, all the, the physical activity that I was uh, used to doing and being able to do, um, I can now do. And uh, it's been life changing for me. Um, I have no more of the symptoms, the, the inflammation uh, is gone. And that just came from, uh, in my case, the final diagnosis uh, was eosinophilic asthma. And so with an allergist actually treating the, the eosinophils, the levels, um, and keeping those under control, that has eliminated all of my symptoms. Uh, how can we choose the right uh, biologics? How to personalize? Which outcomes to follow? Um, is there any any guide or any suggestion that we, we can use to decide to get such an happy ending that we have just heard of? What we hear here from uh, Ms. O'Neill is a happy, let's say, ending, as you are saying, that with a good diagnosis leading to the proper targeted treatment. Uh, also, as you know, even if you select correctly the good biological for the patient is not always um, um, a key of success uh, because it might not respond to that biological. So the rate of response is uh, again, half, half. So it's quite uh, difficult to, to make the decision in the clinic, um, but it has to take into account several um, factors. So what we are recommending, for example, in the ACI guidelines is the triple pillar decision, where you look at the phenotype of the patient, including the comorbidity, then you also associate the biomarkers. Some of those might be easily measurable, like blood eosinophils, and then you also add the outcomes that you would like to achieve. Uh, like, for example, reducing the exacerbations or improving lung function. And based on this uh, triple pillar decision, you choose and you think that you choose the best biological for your patient. So, Joanna, which outcomes uh, uh, and uh, which uh, marker to consider for biologics, but particularly which outcome in terms of, of efficacy uh, has been obtained both in, in uh, randomized clinical trial and uh, in associated uh, post-doc analysis for these biologics? Well, I think that the, the major impact and what really changed the, the field in the treatment of severe asthma was the impact on, ex on exacerbations because they were really uh, more than uh, decreased by more than half which is a real, real success considering the economic burden and the burden on the patient family, on the patient life. So the major success in reducing asthma exacerbations, not necessarily only the severe ones, but also the milder ones that are very well controlled. 
The second is uh, the improvement in lung function that occurs a little bit more with some of the biologicals, not with all of them. And of course, the reduction in the oral corticosteroids is again a major success that we achieve. So with these three, um, uh, let's say, endpoints that are uh, clearly there, I think that we are uh, advancing into a new era of treatment in CDRFC. And one of the things that we always get asked uh, is, okay, I'm going to go see them. How soon should I expect things to change? Is it going to change next week, the next day, after the first dose? What do we tell the patients to expect? Well, I think that's different, Barbara, because you might have what we call super responders, which respond after two or three injections. Uh, they, they really come into your office and they say, doctor, I can fly or something like that. There are, uh, let's say, a little bit uh, later responders, which where you need to explain to them that they need to wait up for up to three or four months or even longer if the asthma is very severe. So it all depends also on the severity of asthma of what you are expecting there or in the, on the way that the patient can avoid the triggers or not. I wondered if uh, we could ask uh, Ms. O'Neill, were you a super responder? Was it overnight? It basically was. I responded well after the first treatment. Interestingly enough, a few days before I took my first biologic injection, I was having an exacerbation and I uh, connected with my doctor and said, hey, I think I need to take, I had some oral steroid medication on me. And I said, I'm going to take this because I'm having some trouble breathing. And that was just a, a few days prior to my very first biologic injection. And so uh, after that first injection, I responded well. So yeah, I would definitely categorize myself as a super responder. You are very lucky. So good ending and very lucky also. Uh, Barbara, what if the treatment doesn't work in the follow-up? What, what, what's, what's the chances and the possibility that we have? There are really needs to be continued monitoring of their symptoms and exacerbations. And if it's not better, we shouldn't say it's one and you're, you strike out. Uh, there are the opportunities to send people back and say, hey, things are not going so well. Is there a different biologic to try? Because they're not all identical. And I think that's important to realize too. Great, thank you. I think we have had a, a great discussion uh, on the management of uh, severe asthma, the use of biologics, so as much as possible to personalize the approach to this severe asthma group of patients. Thank you.